you start to grow your plant, it's, it's immediate, the effect. It's, you know, within, uh, I don't know, 24 hours or something like that, the effect is there for the plant. Um, and what it can do, it helps with, uh, it, it does help with certain nutrients uh, absorption. Uh, and it also creates a biofilm all around the roots. And that is like a protection against any, any little uh, plant pathogen or, or thing like that in the soil. But Welcome to the My Greens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Susan Parent from Premier Tech, who is the company behind the ProMix line of products that most of you guys are familiar with. We're going to do a deep dive into the benefits of different bioadditives for microgreens and edible flowers, the different ProMix products that are best suited for growing, the sustainability of peat moss, soil storage recommendations, and so much more. I learned a lot in this episode, and I know you all will as well. Let's get right into it. Hey, Susan, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on today. Hi, nice to be here. Awesome. So it'd be great to start just kind of understanding what sparked your personal interest and passion for horticulture. Well, uh, I don't think it's just like one thing, you know, it's a combination of many things. Um, I always did like gardening, like, you know, when I was a teenager, I, uh, I, I like to see things grow. Um, I lived in Montreal a good part of my young teenage years, and uh, Montreal has really awesome soil for gardening, so it was a lot of fun and, and, and can be successful. And um, I, when I went to school, I did a degree in biology, and, um, and I, I think during that, it's like a three-year uh, bachelor's and, in science, and um, I really got, we have, you know, the an incredible uh, botanical gardens there in, in, in Montreal. And I, I was really allowed to study about plants a lot. And I discovered this really incredible world of plants and how they are so incredibly adapted to live in you know, different circumstances. And, uh, and that's what, obviously where I learned about you know, all the beneficial microbes you know, in the soil and, and all that which led me to do a master's degree at Laval uh, University in Quebec City um, on mycorrhiza, specifically on mycorrhiza and, and the soil microbiology and, and forest and agriculture type of soils. So all that kind of put together and doing experiences, well, that's when I started to work way back then uh, here at Premier Tech in, uh, in horticulture applications of uh, mycorrhiza inoculants and that's oh, how okay. my, so, my official journey in the working world uh, all started uh, with wow, Premier that's Tech. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I guess b back then there must have not been a whole lot of like, you know, like when I started farming 10 years ago, mycorrhiza was like this hot topic that, you know, everyone was really interested yeah. in how to utilize it for higher yields and stuff like that. Um, when, when, when you started, was it just like in the beginning of, of, of that research in, in application or was yeah. it already being used in, in uh, horticultural applications? Well, there was, um, you know, in, in scientific community, it was known. There was, you know, like a, the North American uh, research group of uh, on mycorrhiza, and uh, so yeah, in, in the scientific world, there was knowledge about mycorrhiza. But in the, um, let's say, in the, the the gardeners or the growers, mycorrhiza was really not actually wasn't known at all. Rhizobium back then was known um, because of the benefits, you know, for uh, the different types of crops that, uh, that yeah. benefit, because it is another type of symbiosis, the rhizobium with the, the legume family, you know, the peas, the soya, the, and um, so that was better known, but not mycorrhiza. And, and also back then, um, to produce mycorrhiza on an industrial basis, it was like almost impossible uh, at that time. So I think that was maybe one of the major um, 
how you'd say, roadblocks uh, for this inoculant or this mycorrhiza, this type of symbiosis to get known better because we couldn't, or we could produce it, but not in the, um, not in the ways we can produce it today. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, that, so that's that, really interesting. I never even thought about the production side of, of like growing mycelium uh, to, to be able to, yeah. you know, use, use it, whether it's, in, is, is it generally like the mycelium or is it spores that are added to, to products? It's spores because oh, okay. the, the spores have a really good viability. And when you're adding it, let's say in a growing media like peat moss and stuff, you want something that's going to survive. You know, you don't want something that's going to be dead after a month. Yeah. So we had to we had to use the spores. But I would say the major roadblock with the, the mycorrhiza um, is that there's like there's many types of mycorrhiza, but let's say the one that's good for most herbaceous types of plants that we're growing. So be it the soya to to p p potatoes or uh, in greenhouse greens, you know, uh, uh, sunflower and, and all these different types of plants, is that this type of mycorrhiza, it's called arbuscular mycorrhiza. And it c cannot grow uh, without a plant root. So, you know, mm. normally these fungus, you know, they need sugars, you know, to be able to, to grow. Um, and normally, molds or other types of fungi, you know, you just put it on a Petri plate, you know, and you have a sugar-based uh, agar or, or gel there, and it just grows on it. Um, this one, one of its ma the, the major challenges was to make it grow alone without the root. Until this day, of 2024, we still cannot grow it alone without the presence of a root that will provide the sugars it needs to grow. Wow. So that was a, that, that, yeah, that was a big thing. So, but we, yeah, we found ways of uh, going to do, you know, research allowed us with collabor collaborations with um, other universities allowed us to, to, to find a way to grow it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to get deep into the conversation with uh, mycorrhiza, biostimulants, biofungicides. I think that's, <laughs> A really interesting topic that um, I I'm just curious about, and I'm sure a lot of listeners as well um, that are microbean growers uh, would like to understand if there's potential benefit for them as farmers to to use those type of products. Um, but uh, like, so so, what is your current role uh, at Premier? Uh, my, well, I worked for a long time uh, in research and development, and uh, and now for the past. I guess 10 to 15 years, I'm more involved in the commercial teams to help uh, with introduction of new products or to answer growers' needs uh, that, and, and how our products can help them out in, in order to, I don't know, to, if they want to convert, let's say, to organic growing, well, what, how can I advise them to do so and um, how can they make the best of our products? And so I do a lot of... Um, kind of trial work with, with the growers um, to see how it works in their, their, their greenhouses. And, and if they have issues, well, I'll, I'll go and, and support the commercial teams to, yeah. to, 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 to try to come up with a, some kind of a suggestion of a new product or something that can help or do soil analysis and try to understand a bit better what the problems are. So. Yeah, they call me horticulture specialist, but it's it's more grower services. That's what I that's what I'm doing now for the past 10, 10, 15 years. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen a whole wide range of issues and solutions to problems for for farms over that period of time, which is really cool. And I'm, I'm guessing it must be quite rewarding to be able to work directly with growers and farmers um, to to help solve those problems. Mm -hmm. oh, definitely, yeah, it's a. Uh, well, because, you know, we all have a certain, I have a certain amount of knowledge, but there's always something new to learn. And, uh, and, and so, so it's, a, a, um, pro it's a progress. It's always a progress, you know, to, to, to be able to uh, gain knowledge and share knowledge. So it's a give and take, you know, it's not just uh, me that gives. Uh, I, do, I do benefit a lot. Yeah, by, yeah. By working with them, yeah. Yeah, learn a lot over that that period. 
Um, okay, that, that's that, that's a that's a great starting point to to know. So Premier makes the ProMix line of products, um, which is you know a very very I would say I don't know if it's the most popular, but as far as I know, it seems to be the most commonly available, um, at least on the more retail small grower side. Um, ProMix is what most migraines growers use, and what you know what I recommend. Um, what would you say like the breakdown of customers between, you know, commercial growers, retail stores, garden centers, or any other sort of customers you have, what that kind of breakdown looks like um, for your product? Well, we have a product that's packaged really for commercial growers. And then we have other products that are packaged more for retail use. Um, so what, what, what you could find in garden centers. But a lot of our customers that are homeowners, for example, or, or you know, not master gardeners, but almost, but they work on a, on a smaller scale, a, a lot of them will use our professional products um, because there is a little bit of a difference between the, the two. The professional products will dry down a lot faster. So, um, so, so they're kind of easier for a greenhouse grower to use, whereas the retail products, a lot of our customers are growing outside and they don't want it to dry down too fast. So we've got like two, two categories of, uh, of products and, and they're labeled that way. So if I'm to make a breakdown, I would say maybe 50% of our products just go to commercial growing and then another 50% goes to garden centers, box stores, and um, home master gardeners, if I can say. Or, and yeah. also like with, with the cannabis, um, uh, a lot of people are growing home, at home. So there's a, a lot of product, professional product that is sold to that type of hobby uh, for the cannabis, got, cannabis yeah. uh, customers. When you say professional product, is like a ProMix HP or MP, are those considered professional yes. products? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From what I've seen, most of the microgreens uh, growers use the, the, the professional grade of products. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, the, and the retail products, so they would be more like a darker kind of peat moss, like they hold more water sort of. Uh, yeah, they, they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll hold more water. And a lot of times there's compost added to that because people like it when it's got this earthy feel to it. The um, homeowners don't really like the dryness of the professional or the commercial uh, growing type of media. And a yeah. lot of time the, the commercial one is in a compressed bale. So they don't, a lot of customers don't like it to have to fluff up the, 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 the bale. Yeah, that makes but, sense. Uh, but there's still a lot that, that prefer the, the professional, you know, especially if you're growing, you know, really if things like microgreens or if you're growing uh, leafy, leafy lettuce and things like that. It's a, it, you know, when you're always like a semi, -ind not industrial, but even though it's a small little greenhouse you have in, in your backyard or something like that, you want something that you can control, you know, if you wet it and then you've got like 10 days of overcast and you can't seem to give it enough fertilizer because it's yeah. always wet. So a lot of the homeowners will, will uh, prefer using the commercial products. Awesome. Out of the commercial products, um, what would you say is the most uh, like best selling soils that you uh, produce for, for commercial growers? Uh, well, I would say there's two best sellers. The, there's what we call the ProMix HP, which is high porosity. So that's if, if you want something that's really going to dry down uh, rapidly. You don't want it. It's for plants that don't want to be always their feet in water. They don't want to have their roots in too much water. That's our HP as a big seller. And the other one is BX that, has, that dries down a little bit less fast. It has less perlite in there. A perlite is like a little aggregate. It's like a little stone that has been expanded and, and that does give aeration to the mix uh, for the plant's initial growth. So those are the two best sellers. But yeah, that's, con yeah. that's in conventional. It's, that's in, so it's not, for, it's not made for organic. They're not certified organic. Yeah. We have some that are certified organic. As yeah, well. that's that's a good point. So in terms of, so what would be the, the best comparisons? Cause I, I get this question a lot and I'm not 
like, I think I know the answer, but I'm not certain. What, what's the best comparison on the organic side for HP and BX for those that want the two different options? Okay. Well, on the organic side, we do now have a HP that's organic. Um, so that would be your equivalent. <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's a, there's a big difference because the organic fertilizer, we don't add any organic fertilizers to that. So it's a product that they have to add their own organic fertilizers to it. Uh, but when it comes to drainage and all that, it's, it's, it's comparable. Those two HP organic and not, they're comparable. Um, and then on the organic side for the BX, the comparison would be the, what we call MP, like multi-purpose uh, organic mix that has that will probably dry down a little bit less fast than the BX, but it, it's the equivalent pot in, in what we call like our potting mixes. Yeah. In the yeah. Organic. Yeah. See, I always thought the MP was like, uh, uh, like, a uh, like closer to HP, but there was no, I think when, you know, when I used MP, there was no organic yeah. HP. Does the organic HP also have coconut bar in it? Like yes. the yeah. MP? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we yeah we have to put the coconut core to help with the water management. Yeah. Because yeah. peat alone, once it dries out, it's really hard to wet up. And, it, and and when you get into organic, we have organic surfactants to help, but they're not quite as good as the ones in conventional. So that's why we put the coconut core in there. Yeah. Yeah. You, like if you just take a bale of peat moss that's dry and just add water to it, it'll just literally float there. It's super mm. hydrophobic. Um, and it's one of the, one of the challenges with growing with peat moss is that if things dry out too much and you don't have, um, uh, like a good surfacant in there that will reabsorb the water easily, it's, it can, it can be a challenge on the watering side sometimes. Um, so yeah, it makes sense that to have the quar in there for, for that. Cause I've noticed that as well is that the, the coconut quar makes it water uh, a lot closer to what something like HP yeah. would then if you just take straight peat moss and try to water it, it's. It, uh, it can be quite challenging without uh, the coir. One challenge I've had with coconut coir in general is that it doesn't, it, 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 it often is, comes from places where they water like brackish water, so it can be a bit salty. Do you guys have any procedure or anything to kind of uh, get rid of the salt or do you purchase coir that already has the salt eliminated or removed? Yeah, the, 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 the coir we get, um is already pre-washed that the, that's what they how it is called uh we're part owners of that company and it's, it's coming from sri lanka so it's really tailored to to our our needs um and it has a low really a low uh, what we call electrical conductivity it's, it's really really low um but when you're working with core you know you have to adapt and you have to you know make sure you're not Putting too much fertil, you know, too much fertilizer, for example, because uh, it, it it can, you know, it can make that EC go up a little bit more than if you're just working with straight peat. So you have to you know, keep an eye on on things when you're working with it. But um, yeah. what we what we're getting is 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 really working very very well. Awesome. Yeah, that that's that's pretty much the biggest concern I've had with using coconut car. I think it's a great growing medium, um, and it's and, and it works well in sync with peat moss i found like mm -hmm. like in the mp product um but the salt content when you just buy like the bricks uh can be very challenging to work with from an ec perspective electrical connectivity um especially as an organic or i was adding in organic fertilizer which can often increase ec not in direct proportion because you have um you know, you, you can't per, you can't just add in nitrogen or just add in phosphorus mm -hmm. that comes with other things in, in organic fertilizers because it's just it, that's the way natural fertilizers work. Um, so it, I found it in the early years when I was using coconut coir, it was more challenging to manage the fertilizer mm -hmm. uh, from an organic perspective. So that's great that you you guys are having uh, washed coir. Uh, another uh, question I have that uh, I think a lot of people that use ProMix might be interested in hearing is like what as a as someone who who uses like a Promix HP or MP or whatever it may be, what services are available from P Premier to kind of help the growers out in terms of if they're having any challenges with with uh, you know growing their microgreens or edible flowers or whatever they yeah. they're, they're growing? Well, we have um, 
uh, I don't know if we can say like it's like a grower services uh, uh, where you can on our website you can you can ask questions and someone will answer them so you can do it online you can phone we've got a, a grower services 1-800 number where you can phone you can phone also our customer service um, which is another 1-800 nu number or or email them and, and say about your problem and they'll direct you to the proper grower services person all depending on where you're living uh, like I cover the, the Maritimes Quebec and, and Ontario and, and Canada but we have someone else that does the US Eastern US you know, Western Canada so uh, th there's many ways you can reach us um, but on our website I think even our I'm pretty, yeah, you can contact us directly, even on the website. Uh, just go to the section that's called Grower Services or... And, awesome. So, yes. so like, the, the way it kind of would work is, is they, like, if, let's say, it's not a simple problem that can be solved with, like, a, a online chat sort of thing, then they'll direct you to one of, um, like, either yourself or someone else um, that has a similar role that can help diagnose the problem and try to figure out yeah. what how to solve whatever it is, whether it's, you know, could be a disease issue or, you know, maybe something with the soil or something like that. So you, you can help kind of direct them in the right direction to, to solve those problems. Yeah, well, we can do some, you know, pr resolution, you know, problem resolution. We can do some on it. There's a limit, you know, at, at some yeah. point, if it's a, um, I don't know, if we're talking about a huge, huge greenhouse, uh, I, well, you know, maybe we'll have to go and, go and visit, you know, like a, a grower that's having a, an incredible uh, issue and he doesn't know what it is. And, uh, you know, if, but if he's using, especially if he's using our products, I mean, if he's using someone else's products, well, we'll, we'll encourage him to go and contact whoever, whoever sold him his growing media. But, um, yeah, we can, uh, we can even go, uh, go visit the customer, get some samples, get them analyzed because we work also with independent labs that, um, that service U.S. And, and Canada, all depending, you know, where, where you're living. And then we get, and that, that helps a lot. Oh, um, yeah. Or, or, or if our local sales rep, um, you know, we have independent sales reps that are located, you know, throughout Canada. So you can contact them and they, they will reach out and try to find a someone to help you <laughs> that's for sure yeah for sure yeah i i've in my years of farming i've had many soil tests done uh, and and found some very interesting results there was once we had a um a brassica mold i can't remember the exact name but it was like one of the first reported cases in canada and we were really struggling with keeping it under control on our like mustard greens and um, and luckily we were able to actually finally eliminate it after a couple of years. But it was only after like diagnosing it and knowing what it is that we we're able to try to find solutions to the problem. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of growers will spend a lot of time just being like, okay, it must be pythium or it must be you know fusarium or whatever it, it, you know whatever diseases uh, it appears to be. But if you actually go and do a soil analysis or a leaf analysis, then you can actually figure out what it is. And there's some great labs now. For example, mm -hmm. University of Guelph, they do like a full DNA analysis. Um, yeah. uh, and it's relatively affordable to figure out what, you know, what is actually the disease. Because as an example, I didn't know that there's multiple types of, of uh, pythium. So there's some that are really dominant in, in cold temperatures. And there's other ones that are much more suited to warm temperatures. And because we were like an indoor vertical farm, we were having the, the high temperature one. And in my experience in a, in, in a greenhouse, I was used to dealing with the cold temperature uh, pythium mm -hmm. and thinking that I need to increase the water temperature to reduce its ability to spread when it was actually the opposite. Um, so having the actual data on what disease or pathogen, if that's what it is, uh, it makes it so much easier to solve the problem than just trying to play guesswork and being, trying to be a, a, a plant doctor without proper diagnosis tools. True, true, yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, you know, if it, you have, if you have insects, well, if you don't, you know, put them on the, if you don't put those sticky cards, you don't know what, what your, what, what are the populations are. And, uh, so you, you really need to have, uh, that type of, uh, information for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's actually a good point. Is like you know, um, because I think a lot of migrants farms are indoors. They don't have a lot of pest issues, so I haven't really talked about like um, IPM much on on the podcast. But uh, integrated pest management for those that haven't heard of that. But uh, yeah, in a greenhouse, that's like a really important part of of keeping things going smoothly yeah. because a greenhouse is a whole different set of challenges than uh, growing in like an indoor kind of vertical farm uh, situation. Mm, true. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, peat moss, uh, which is the main ingredient in most of uh, the ProMix product lines, um, I- I've learned a lot <laughs> in the COVID years because um, we had a lot of challenges. I'm sure uh, you guys did as well with, with uh, sourcing peat moss. And then I found out that there's so many different grades of peat moss. Um, which I thought was fascinating. So I, I'd love from, you know, your more expert level of understanding of this, um, what the kind of different, you know, grades of PMOS are and what their use cases are for, for different growers. Okay. Well, um, peat moss, it, it comes from a bog. So, okay. And there's different types of bogs, but the, the preferred type of bogs that we're using to harvest this peat moss, it's, it's coming from the north. So it's what we call, um, they're more acidic type of bogs than those that you will find in the south that are, so they're, without getting into big detail, uh, bogs is a, a wetland and, 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 and in, in nature, it's an accumulation of sphagnum over years. So, um, you know, it can be mixed uh, with some wood, like, um, especially here in North America, there's a, there's a lot of trees that, tree roots and things like that that you can find in a bogs but so a, a bog can accumulate over hundreds of years sphagnum peat moss so the sphagnum peat moss on the top layer okay is the most uh, fibrous one and as you go deeper and deeper in the bog the peat will eventually uh, a bit like in a soil you know you have that humus you know you have the leaf litter and then you have the what we call the humus or the dark soil or black earth or whatever well in the bog it's a bit different it's that it it remains like a litter that's on over you know i don't know 30 40 50 60 uh, feet high or in in, in meters you know 20 30 uh, meters high the, the the decomposition process is really really slow in soil, it's really, really fast because you've got worms, you've got all sorts of things there that biodegrade the, the organic matter. But in a bog, it's really, really slow and it's very acidic. So there's not a whole lot of things that can live there. So when we harvest a bog, um, we, well, we have to do like drainage. So we have to drain it to remove all the water. And the top layers is, is what we call the most fibrous fibers. And that is what, um, is what is mainly used in a growing media for a professional use. When we go down deeper in, in, in the bog, so let's say if we go down, I don't know, uh, four, three, three or four feet down into the bog, so uh, one meter da- down or two meters, all depending of so many other factors, uh, but um, that's where you'll see that the fiber is less, is, is finer or will break down a little bit more. So that's when you get into the grades that, of peat moss that you'll find more in retail, what, the, what they will call black earth. It's not, it's not really earth. It's actually, it's decomposed sphagnum Interesting. moss. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so it's not true earth. Well, anyways, 99% of the what's sold it, you know, maybe if you have a landscaper and he has access to some soil, then maybe that's true. But what you buy in bags, anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a peat moss. So the greater the decomposition is, is in the bottom of, of the, what is harvested, and the top layers is what's really fibrous. And that's what we put into the professional media, because that will hold water real fast, but will release water real fast. As you go down, it'll hold water, and not, but not as fast, and will not release as fast the water. So that's basically the, the difference is really the, the, the level of decomposition uh, that has been going on in, in the bog 
prior to yeah. when we started to harvest it. Interesting. So, so how, like you said, there is just a few feet, like the first five or 10 feet are the, like the, the, the more fibrous and then the rest of that, like 50, well, 60 feet or. Well, yeah, it, it, it becomes kind of, uh, let's say you would dig a ditch and you would look at the profile, your, the, the profile in the bog. Yeah. You'll see at, at the top layers, you know, you can really recognize really well the fibers. You know, you can, you can almost see it. Uh, not almost, you, you see it. You, you can really recognize the, the structures. And then as you go deeper, well, you see that it's starting to break down a bit more and it looks darker. And, and, and so that is uh, the, the, the natural process. But those darker layers, it's kind of difficult to give you an exact amount of meters down deep, all depending on the, the bog itself. There's some that are very deeper and some that are less deep. But normally when, they, when we begin to harvest a bog, we have to have a certain amount of that fibrous because that is the most uh, used in, in growing media is those fibrous ones. Yeah, so that, sure. fiber, that That fibrous layer, I would say. That's really interesting. So would you say generally there's a lot more of the like retail, like if you were to harvest uh, the average bog, is there a lot more of the, the retail peat that's taken out compared to the, the more fibrous peat moss in, in uh, like the, as a whole of the bog? No, because we don't, um, we, you know, we'll only harvest according to demand of, of uh, the market. So we're not going to, and also we, like the, the, the Canadian sphagnum peat moss industry as a whole, so all, all, all producers of growing media with peat moss, we have a, a principle where we don't want to dig where there's nothing left. So, and, and we want to re restore that environment once we're finished harvesting the peat. So we don't want to just dig up to dig up. We, you know, we want, yeah. to, we want to make sure that we leave the environment where it's, it will naturally, because there's a, we, we do bog restoration and, and where we introduce living sphagnum on top of an environment there that has been harvested and, and, and it normally takes off after a couple of years. Uh, the, 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 bo the, yeah, the bog looks almost like it was before, but yeah, there has been some uh, activity in there, but uh, the, the, we can make a bog become alive again. Yeah, by introducing yeah. living living sphagnum. Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of people, um, like, and, and to a certain degree, even myself, understand that it takes like a very long time to restore a bog when it's harvested. Are we as a whole, like, the amount of peat moss we're using? Are we, um, are we eventually going to run out of peat moss at the way we're consuming it? Do you do you know anything about the? like that side of things? Yeah, yeah. No, no uh, I don't think we'll run out. Uh, there's a lot of, really a lot of bogs uh, in Canada. They're not all accessible. I, I think that we're presently using 0.01% of all the bogs in Canada for harvesting peat moss. So it's a really small percentage that are being harvested. Oh, wow. Uh, so we're not like in, I, I know like in Europe, there's, Maybe you've heard about peat bands and, and things yeah. like that. Um, that's more because in Europe, um, they, they use it for a lot of other things, not just horticulture. They use it for, 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 to generate, uh, to heat houses with it and all that. So, um, <clears throat> and transfer it, transform it into some kind of a, like a fuel. Uh, here we only use it for horticulture. For sure, yeah, no, that that's really interesting to to know because, like, you know, I I feel that even myself, I had a misconception that, like, you know, we're gonna at some point, like, kind of like oil, we're eventually gonna run out of of pea moss. But if we're using, you said point one or point zero one percent. Point zero one. Point wow. zero one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. But, yeah. There's a the Canadian sphagnum peat moss. Uh, has a web page. It has really a lot of information to kind of explain things, uh, and it's not just one company. It's a, it's a yeah. They represent the industry, uh, but it, it does give true facts, and it's there's, re, there's a lot of research 
been done on that. So it's, um, it's, it's documented facts. It's not just uh, greenwashing and, and things like that. There's a, there's a lot of facts about the, the peat moss. And yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's helpful for anyone that wants to check it out. Because like, there's yeah, there's you know, I, I've experienced a lot of misinformation just over the years and. Like someone says something, then everyone believes it, sort of thing. So I think it's important for people to just kind of, you know, do uh, do some further digging if they are concerned about uh, the use of PMOS in the long run from a sustainability perspective. Um, so yeah, I just encourage people to to do research on that to to you know make your own uh, educated opinion on that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing that a lot of people ask about is, is storing. Um, the bales of, of ProMix, whether it's HP or MP um, or BX. Do you have any rec like specific recommendations for people to, um, to like how they should store the product, how long it'll last stored in the in the in the in the bales? Uh, yeah. Well, overall, um, I would say uh, the the peat moss itself uh, can be stored for a long time. Uh, where you'll run into some changes in the product is with the start, because we do put a starter charge in it, and we do put uh, what we call a wetting agent or a surfactant. And uh, some of the, uh, the starter charge um, in heated areas, so let's say when it goes up to 20, 30 degrees, some of that starter charge will be biodegraded by the natural micro microorganisms in the peat moss. And the same thing with the wetting agent. Um, if it's stored at minus 20, like we're getting uh, these days here in January, um, you know, the product of the remains pretty well intact. Uh, it's just if it has been stored for many, many months at 20, 30 degrees Celsius, some of the nutrition will change a bit. Some of the some of the calcitic lime, maybe the pH will go up a bit, because we do have to put limestone in the peat moss to to adjust the pH, so it's not acidic for for too acidic for plants. And uh, yeah, and the wetting agent uh, after one year, I would say, it's it's starting to show signs of uh, losing its wetting capacity. So, yeah, I would say. If you could keep it stored out of the sun, uh, that would be the best way to to have the longer yeah. longer preservation. I would say of the wetting agent and some yeah, of that nutrient. That's, that's helpful. Also. Yeah, I, I, I would guess most growers don't don't keep product that long, but it's helpful to know to, like if they can keep it out of the sun as much as they can. Then uh, that it's 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 not it, it, like it, like there's natural bacteria in these bogs and, and, and that will grow when it dries, when it's relatively dry. Um, that, that, that's, is that correct? Yeah, well, it, it, there's, there's some bacteria, but there, there's some, I would say molds. So these are saprophytic. These are not dangerous. It can even be beneficial. Um, yeah, and they can, uh, all depending on the humidity of the peat, the, you know, the temperature, uh, all these factors combined, you can have a little bit more some years than other years, and these will kind of eat up some of that that uh, nitrogen that you're adding in there, um, which will cause that that is the biodegradation caused by the natural uh, microflora that comes with the peat. I think where it comes that idea that it's sterile is that it's there's no pat plant pathogens, there's no um, like in a regular soil where you can have plant, like an agricultural yeah. soil where you have plant pathogens, you can have uh, nematodes and things like that. You, you don't have any of those pathogenic forms in peat moss. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good distinction. Because, um, yeah, like I've never had peat moss be contaminated with pythium or, you know, things like that. It's, it's been quite incredible. Like it usually comes from the seed. Uh, or if you add compost or things yeah. like that, that's where it usually comes from. Uh, it's actually a, a, a unique benefit of peat moss is that it's in such an acidic environment where it's grown that most of the typical plant pathogens like just don't survive or don't live in that environment. So mm -hmm. it gives a, a unique opportunity for growers starting seedlings to not have to worry about, you know, all the, the wide array of potential plant pathogens that can come in from compost, mm -hmm. worm castings, uh, topsoil, all that kind of stuff. 
True. Um, and another question I've gotten quite a few times now um, with mostly new growers, but um, sometimes there's like a bit of like, what you'll see is like mold or on the MP, I've noticed like a little bit of like orange mold that will form where the plastic meets the, um, mm-hmm. the, the bale itself, the compressed bale. Um, my understanding is that it's completely not harm, harm, harmful at all, but I just wanted to get your take on, you know, what that is and where it kind yeah. of comes from. Yeah, that's one of the different molds that c- comes naturally with the peat moss. And again, the storage conditions, sometimes there's a bit of humidity between the plastic and the peat. And there, there's like a perfect site there for them to, to grow. Uh, no, they're not... They're not they're not uh, harmful to plants. Uh, can be a bit of a nuisance. I would say just remove that little crust and th- throw it away. But I know some people, um, you know, they, they, you know, they still have to do the good practices. Don't compact your growing media when you're filling up pots, um, because the growing media has to breathe. So yes, the, there are some of these natural occurring ones, but if, if the plants are too compact, if they're getting too much water, you can get things growing on the surface. Sometimes it's algae, sometimes it can be mold. So the, the, the idea is just really space out the watering, only water when you need, and especially don't compact. Because these natural occurring, not so, algae is not so much a problem. Algae comes with the greenhouse and, and the, yeah. the water, but some of these molds, they can also grow on the top of the pots when you're growing. So you have to, you know, be sure you let dry down enough. Uh, that's really important. Yeah, for sure. When there's moisture between the plastic and the bale, and I've never like c- cut off or not used that area, you just mix it in and then most of those spores will, will just die or not be able to thrive because they're, yeah. you just disturb their environment. And True. again, they're not harmful yeah. to, uh, to, to the plants at all. So yeah. just yeah. something for, for people that are new in the industry that I've seen that and might be worried about it. It's it, like, from my opinion, it seems like your opinion as well. It's not something to really be concerned about. No, no and normally once exposed to air, that will disappear anyways. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Um, now, last question before we get into the the part I'm most excited about is um, wh- like, so I've had people in, you know, some states say, hey, they have they have trouble finding like Promix HP. So I was just curious on where you guys sell uh, the Promix line of the, the, the commercial grade of products in North America and where you don't sell it just to, I think it'll help uh, people understand, you know, where they can access okay. this product. Well, uh- I think uh, any major distribution uh, in, in Canada uh, or in the U.S., a big horticultural supply distributor, they will have it. Um, well, maybe there's some that don't, but they'll they'll uh, they can fo- you know they can phone us on our cust- at our customer service and we'll we'll tell them where they can find it. Uh, but I would say the major distribution, uh, like in Ontario. Uh, in Quebec, they, they all have uh, they all have it. Yeah. Okay. And then, so if so- someone's in like, uh, you know, the Western U.S., they can still get like you guys still will sell to distributors in that area, yes. correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so- we we sell even to Mexico. So. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 helpful. Okay, so your product is available everywhere. It's just a matter of if a distributor carries it in the local area, sort of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. normally the bigger ones. I don't know about all the little uh, co-ops and all that. Maybe yeah. uh, they they don't. But um, the but not you know they're, they're, I'm not saying a hundred percent. But the the major ones, you know, like in the U.S., you've got the. Uh, uh, Big names there like Griffin, yeah. and, and in Canada you've got uh, uh, you've got a Terrace and Plant Products, and these are all uh, Nutrien out west. So there's 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 a lot there that that have, yeah yeah I believe Hydro Farm is probably the biggest one in in the U S. Um, especially for the the you know the microgreens industry a lot when they're starting out they're buying from hydroponic stores, so a lot of them will can can access the product from. Um, from Hydro Farm. Now, if a grower wants to buy direct from Promix, is that an option for, for growers? Um, well, it's, there's always an option. It's just that we don't deliver pallet quantities. So, uh, and, and, and I think it's better for the, the grower to go through distribution. He's not going to get it less. He won't pay less 
if it goes direct with us and we can't really service very well a couple of pallet customers so yeah. i would say they better they're they're going to be a lot better serviced with our distribution channel for sure for sure yeah i believe yeah it seems like most of the uh, soil companies like to make it economical to 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 ship it has to be by the truckload which is like a a lot of soil a lot of soil yeah yeah like i would have loved to be able to purchase um truckloads but in my scenario with living earth farm we just didn't have storage space like we would go through soil pretty fast yeah. but um we we just didn't have space to store it so we couldn't like we didn't have the ability to store like you know 8 12 of just like cuz we had a lot of different things we needed to store of just like the soil itself or the pea moss. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, not, yeah, like I think that's helpful for people to, to just know um, that uh, going through dis distrib distributors is, is will be the most economical way to get the ProMix uh, line of products. Now, this is the part I'm really excited about, um, which is uh, the additives, because this is something that you specialize in. You actually, you know, like you said, you studied your, your master's in mycorrhiza additives. So um, the ProMix products, there's a, there's a few different additives, including mycorrhiza, biostimulants, and biofungicides. So I'd love to hear more on these additives and, and their, you know, their benefits for, sure. um, you know, greenhouse growers or microgreens growers. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, we'll start with mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza, there's many types of mycorrhiza, but I'll just concentrate on the mycorrhiza for herbaceous type of plants or for microgreens or for tomato, cucumbers, uh, you know, that, that type of plant. Um, so this is a, uh, it's a fungus and it, um, it, it, it really, we, we, we can put it into the, feed it into the growing media so that when the first roots start to grow, they come in contact with these spores and it colonizes the roots. And when the plant is getting Everything it needs, you know, conditions are ideal. Uh, you know, you maybe not see, oh, is there something, you know, is this mycorrhiza really, is this, this stuff really working? The, 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 the fact of adding the mycorrhiza is that you're increasing your rooting capacity to absorb nutrients. That's one of the benefits. But also you're occupying a part of the soil, so you've got access to water, you have, you help, it helps the plants also manage water stress, you know, and uh, wilting points and, and things like that. Oh, so the, the advantages are, are, are really very long, but I'll just kind of keep it down to a couple ones. Um, uh, nutrients, like nutrients that are non-mobile, like phosphorus, for example, that are non-mobile in the so soil, <clears throat> uh, it, it, will, it will help in picking up these nutrients and some of the minor elements. It, it does help with with uh, resistance to water stress, heat stress, um, and so so. The thing is, is that when the plants are growing in ideal conditions in the greenhouse, uh, that that's great. But when you, the minute you bring it outside or you bring it to an environment, the the real world, uh, where uh, you'll have more stress and all that, that's where the the fact of having those mycorrhiza in the root systems will really make the plant a lot more stronger, healthier, and, and more resistant. Um, when, when we're in, for example, um, for, for, for sprouts or, or really short, short time plants in two, three weeks, you may not really see the benefit of adding mycorrhiza for really, really short plants uh, cycles. Uh, anything over four or five weeks that lettuce for example where there might be some i don't know cold weather or stressful weather in the greenhouse that then the mycorrhiza can can have a benefit um, and this mycorrhiza is, is good with almost everything except a couple of plants like that need a specific type of mycorrhiza like orchids and blueberry plants as you know the more acid loving plants and and forest trees like uh, balsam fir and, and things like that. They need a, a different type of mycorrhiza. Yeah. So it's something that's very general that that is really there for the plant. Um, so you don't need to fertilize as much. You don't. You, you can really cut back on that. And um, 
it's not, you know, if you put it in the desert and you're not giving it any water, I mean, look, you know, we have to be yeah. realistic. <laughs> yeah. But it, sure. it, it really reduces stress. Okay, so yeah. that's in, there's a lot of research that's been done on mycorrhiza and uh, in all sorts of applications. It's uh, mycorrhiza have been present on the very first plants that were growing on, on land on the land when you know when you go back into the evolution of, of plants on on earth so wow. it, it's something that 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 plants have really that need you know you go into any forest soils you've got mycorrhiza on on your trees on your plants uh, it's only when you go into ag agriculture soils where there's a lot of uh, you know you 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 you, you you disturb the soil, you turn the soil and all that. And that's what really kind of cr creates um, less mycorrhiza or less mycorrhiza available uh, for plants. So it's, it's in the very intense type of uh, growing conditions where the mycorrhiza will uh, the, be less available to plants. And in growing media, there's no natural occurring mycorrhiza. So you, you, that's why we have to add it to the plants. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's um, that, that's helpful to know because um, my, my understanding was that microgreens wouldn't really benefit. And, and I think you'd confirm that. But there's a lot of growers that grow edible flowers that are much longer period of time. Yeah. Um, and if you don't like, you know, as a plant gets bigger in a small pot, like it's more chance of it being underwatered. So having the mycorrhiza will help prevent that stress from affecting the growth of the plant and same yeah. thing with nutrient absorption. So yeah. I think there, there is an application for the mycorrhiza yeah. um, for, for more longer term yeah. crops that you said. And, and, and there's years. really a, a, a lot, but if I, you know, just to draw, I just want to kind of limit to it uh, because it does help with, um, you know, let's say different secondary metabolites to produce secondary metabolites and things like that. It, it, it'll increase it. It increases flowering. It can, it, it can. Increase, oh, interesting. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of uh, benefits, uh, but again, you know, you have to make it fit into your growing conditions. And it, as, as long as it's more than two, three weeks, I'd say four weeks, I think that's where it can be. Uh, you can see the benefit, but it won't harm anything if you, you do use it. Uh, yeah, exactly. On, yeah. And, 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 and you don't. So there's never a negative uh, effect. Yeah. If anything, um, it would take up more of the soil space that would prevent bad bacteria or bad true, types of fungus true. to take over. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. Now, when we get when we talk about biostimulants and biofungicides in our in, in, in the Promix products, um, the reason why we've got it, it's the same organism. It's just that in the U.S., it's labeled biofungicide because it's registered with EPA, the Environmental oh. Protection Agency. In Canada, um, the equivalent would be uh, PMRA, the Plant uh, Protection uh, Agency. Uh, but if you do that, and, and, and we have registered our, because us, it's a bacteria, the, these, uh, this biostimulant or the biofungicide, it's a, it's a bacteria called Bacillus. Um, if we sell it that way here in Canada, it has to be stored like a pesticide. It has to go uh, into the chemical, yeah. Room. And growing media, you, you you don't want it in a chemical room, and and so that's why it's labeled biostimulant in Canada. Got but, it. And and what what is the the benefits? Yes, it does have something interesting that the mycorrhiza doesn't have is that it's an immediate effect. So you you start to grow your plant. It's, it's immediate, the effect. It's, you know, within, uh, I don't know, 24 hours or something like that, the effect is there for the plant. Um, and what it can do, it helps with, uh, it, it does help with certain nutrients uh, absorption. Uh, and it also creates a biofilm all around the roots. And that is like a protection against um, any, any little... Uh, plant pathogen or, or thing like that in the soil. But officially here in Canada, we can't claim for that because it's not registered as that. But in the U.S., we have seen and uh, many occasions reduction of root rotting diseases, for example, like wow. uh, Fusarium pythium, Rhizoctonia. And we've also noticed 
and we can't claim that here in Canada, is reduction of certain insects like fungus gnats um, on those yellow sticky cards, you know, that you can yeah, put in the yeah. greenhouses. When you use this bacteria with the mycorrhiza, for, for example, you get reduction of uh, uh, fungus gnat populations. It's not 100% perfect, but it, it, it will contribute to reducing those fungus gnat wow. populations. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I didn't know those. Because I think those two are really big benefits for microgreens growers because a lot of growers deal with 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 pythium is is, is the most common uh, challenge that that people have and i have my own you know ways to to reduce it including using vermiculite which is kind of like on top of the seed uh, mm. works really well but for people that were really struggling that might be a great option and then yeah. i know a few farms that have a ton of fungus gnat issues because they're growing uh, a lot of longer term crops okay. um, in, in, in like edible flowers and longer term microgreens. So having something that comes already in the soil ready to go would yeah. be a, a easy way for them to reduce those populations. Yeah. Um, so that, that, th those are like phenomenal benefits. Now is the, uh, is the products that, um, cause I haven't seen them as commonly available. Is that something that like is, is, is the distributors can, can access if they, yes. if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's available. Yeah. Okay. It's, that's good uh, to know. It's not our, because it'll often come in, in seeding mixes, but it does come also in BX in HP. It's with the mycorrhiza. So they'll add the bacteria with to the mycorrhiza, but in the yeah. seeding mixes, it will be just, just the bacteria alone. So either the biostimulant or the biofungicide in, in the U S. Yeah. yeah. And is, is there any difference in the shelf life of the product? If it has no. that in it? No, no. same so, thing. Okay. No, awesome. I, yeah. Yeah. I, actually the bacteria is very, very resistant to over for over a year. It's, it's still very, yeah. very, very, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's like the, it's like a similar concept for the soil as like taking a probiotic for, cause bacillus is also like a commonly you, like, I know there's tons and tons of varieties of, yes. of bacillus, right? It's the same kind of concept where, you know, you take a probiotic, it provides your immune system support mm. to protect against, you know, the COVID virus and, you know, colds and flus and other sort of potential pathogens. And it's really cool to see like the same concept where it will, it'll literally form around the roots and protect the roots from, you know, plant pathogens. I think that's like, you know, uh, a really cool kind of natural way without using pesticides and, and other sort of chemicals yeah. to, um, to improve the quality of the soil for, for, for the plants and for the growers that are growing them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, awesome. There is a, yeah, there is, there is a similarity there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wish, I wish we had more time to go deeper into, um, into all that, that kind of stuff. Cause I'm sure we could probably talk for an hour on just that alone. Um, but I'm just curious if there's any like, you know, new or exciting R and D projects that either you're working on or your team is working on that you're able to share with our listeners. If there's, you know, cause it seems like you guys always have new products on the go. Well, we have, well, there's a lot of, um, there's always, you know, research on new organisms, new microorganisms that we could use. Um, like there's one that's come out. Uh, it's not available in growing media yet, but uh, that it's, uh, we sell it alone for the the the, the family of uh, like canola family. You know, that doesn't yeah. form any mycorrhiza. So we've come up with uh, an organism that can help that family. Uh -huh. uh, have access to to nutrients and things like that in, in, in the soil. So that that's something that's that's um, coming out just uh, alone, not not in a growing media yet. And we're continuing to look at different other organisms that 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 can help. Um, we do a lot of research with our research partner, university partners on um, sustainability you know uh, peat moss sustainability that's a, a big um, a big thing that uh, you know we want to be better prepared you know to do a, a good job of harvesting peat moss and and to minimize uh, you know co2 emissions and, and things like that that's a big thing and and in products well you know we would you know, we, we are looking at substitute fibers to peat moss because we are aware that it is, um, you know, you know, some people might feel that, you know, peat moss is, uh, 
it, it, it is a carbon emitting uh, activity. So, you know, could we find something else that has less impact? But that that is, um, you know, n nothing to come out in the next year. Yeah, no, yeah. Nothing that, in it, the, it's a hard problem to solve. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, we use, you know, we, we do use cocoa fibers, but yeah. uh, which is uh, which which is good. But it, we are looking at other other things as well. And also, you know, to in the uh, for the uh, <clears throat> organic uh, growing media, you know, different things that can be better this, than try to find a better formulation or things like that for the organic growers. Yeah, yeah, that's um, uh, that would be a fun job, but a very challenging job because, like, I just think about as an example in the plastics industry, um, like we use so much plastic to to package our products and. Um, and, I, and from my research, the corn-based plastic isn't really a you know a good long-term solution, mm. um, and it's you know it's a big problem to solve to try to find an alternative that yeah. works that like plastic because you know plastic is such an effective um, you know material for for packaging, and uh, it's the same thing like to find a good substitute for for peat moss uh, and or coconut coir is <laughs> that's a that's a that's a big challenge. That's um, yeah. So, but it's cool that you guys are, are researching that and try to find alternatives because I think um, it, you know it's it's always good to be doing that kind of that kind of research. Um, I'd love to kind of hear what your what your favorite part of of your job is. Um, you know, it sounds like you've been doing it for a long time, and I'd love to kind of hear like what what is you know what really brings you joy in, in the work you do. Uh, well, I th well. Well, working with the growers, I think, is is really in, in, it's enriching. It's really interesting. Um, I you know, I think they're they're incredible. You know, to run a business and 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 grow the plants and manage all that. I think that's really interesting, and and it's and it's interesting to work with them. But I think also what's what's good is that there's always a lot to learn. Um, you know, so you don't feel as if oh, you know. It's boring, you know. There, there's always something new that's coming up, and how you can integrate that, and how you can understand things better. So I think there's a lot of uh, there's always a possibility to learn, and I, and I think that's really positive. Um, you know, it's not because I've been around a long time that I know a lot. Yeah, I've got experience, but I need to feel that I'm learning. You know? For sure. So so, I, so that's another good part of it, and um, yeah, and 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 also. Uh, this company, you know, there's like a lot of you know, good ideas. So I keep feeling as if I'm, uh, yeah, adapting. The adaptation to new ways of thinking is 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 really good, and I think that I think that makes you you know more open-minded and as, as a person. And uh, yeah, I find it's uh, that, yeah, that's like more maybe more personal uh, sides of things. Uh, uh, that I uh, like working about it, but I think um, the, the, the industry as a whole that that I'm able to to follow it and go to conferences and things like that to continue to learn. I think that's uh, one of the good good parts of the of, this yeah. job, of my job anyway. Yeah, no, like I, I would, I, I like it. Sounds like a a really rewarding and, and fun job to do, and, and it's great that you can continuously learn um, in, in a path like that. I think that's you know so important to always be like, you know, having challenges and, and learning. And, um, you know, it's, it brings a lot of, at least for me, a lot of satisfaction in, in the, the work I've done with the farm and what I'm doing now with consulting is being able to like, you know, have challenges that, you know, push my understanding mm -hmm. and, and learn. And that's, you know, what, part of the reason this podcast, like I learned a lot on this episode and, um, and I'm sure a lot of growers, you know, will learn a lot as well. And I think it's, it's really valuable to always be in that mindset of always wanting to learn. Yeah. I, I, I hope to plan to do that for the rest of my life, whether I'm working or not, just always want to learn and, and, uh, and grow as a person. And, and it's great that uh, you see that in, in your job and you get to experience that on a, on a, uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I guess I'm lucky, <laughs> or <laughs> I'm lucky, or you make your luck. I don't know what it yeah. is. But <laughs> I think a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, last question. Uh, if I ask this to everyone, whether they're farmers or you know anything, anything else, is that if you can go back in time to when you started working at Premier and meet the younger version of yourself, what advice would you give? The younger Susan to set them up for success. 
Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Um, what could I would give uh, uh, an advice? Uh, maybe be patient. <laughs> patience is uh, is um, yeah, it is good. Sometimes you know when we're starting, you know we want to you know you know advance and um, and sometimes uh, it's maybe maybe good just to step back a bit and and, and not just run into things. Um, some people are more patient than others, but I, I think it's yeah, it's worth take time to to uh, maybe also know what has been done before, and instead of doing it all over again, um, a lot of times because it's was done a long time ago, people think it's not so good. But sometimes there's some good things that were done, and maybe you know 20, 25 years ago. But if you never ask. You won't know what was done and yeah. what, what was positive and what was negative uh, uh, out of that. And that's great. <laughs> I think that's 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 super helpful. Like it, it's a good point. Like you know, you know, in history, history repeats itself. And like education, if if there's something that someone learns but there's no, as example, study published, then no one knows that that information is there. So sometimes going back in history and seeing what was already done can help you advance in whatever whatever it is that you're doing. Like. You know, yeah. So I, I think I think that's that's great advice. And yeah, patience is is something that um, that I think all of us have uh, you know to learn over time uh, from when we're a kid and we have the least amount of patience. To as time goes on, we we learn to um, to be more patient with with things and let things kind of go as they as the you know the natural flow of things in in terms of you know time. Because yeah, like I'm always I'm I'm. I'm still that way where I want things to move faster than, than, than they are. Mm -hmm. Um, but it takes it away from like enjoying what you're doing right now. So it's, uh, uh you know, for me, a practice in, in, in learning that kind of patience. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, I don't know. It's patience or it's, uh, maybe, uh, you know, don't talk too fast, you know, just, you know, think, think more. Uh, I would yeah. that, when I was a kid, they would always tell me, you know, make it go through your head a, a couple of times and see if, is that really the way, right way to ask things or, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> awesome. This has been, this has been a, like a really great interview. I, I learned a lot and I know uh, the listeners will as well. So if, if anyone wants to connect uh, with you or learn more about Premier, uh, where can they find uh, you guys online? Well, you can uh, you can uh, go to our website, which is uh, pthorticulture.com. And if you go to uh, Grower Services, you can see uh, who's a Grower Services rep in, in your area. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Susan. It's been great You're having welcome. you here. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Mike Green's business, visit MikeGreensConsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Mike Green's businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Greens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Greens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.